that they were to leave. After 400 years, they were to leave. And the Bible tells us that Moses said to them on the night that God would pass through the land. This is the last curse. God sent ten curses or ten trials upon the people of Egypt, Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the leader of the Egyptians, before he was allowed to go. He sent every kind of thing he could take of, um, turn the water into blood, frogs, flies, you name it. He sent all these things upon them. Sometimes we have the idea that if God would just send a curse on somebody, if God would just pick somebody up and slap them upside the head, <laughs> that they'd get the life of God. You know, God can do that. And some some cases He did. But God knows who will respond to that kind of thing and who won't. And the Pharaoh, the word Pharaoh simply is like our word president. He would not allow the children to go. He would not allow God's people to leave Egypt. And so these ten plagues came upon Egypt, the Egyptians. And the last of this was found in verse number 12. And I will begin reading in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What we're going to do now is going to be the first month, and it's going to be that way from now on. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, say, In the tenth day of this month, thou shalt take to them every man a lamb. Everybody, every man is to give a lamb. Everybody say, A lamb. Amen. Well, let's everybody say that, okay? That's what I said. Everybody say that. Amen. Amen. Okay? And according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. In other words, every household in Egypt that were Israelite was to take a lamb. Now, the Bible says, if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the soul. In other words, count everybody in the house, house and let them join together, just one or two in this house or whatever. And the Bible says, Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the land. In other words, based on how much you eat. And you tell these people that God knows that these people ain't Baptists. <laughs> he would said, if, he had, if they'd been Baptists, he'd take, said, take you five, six lessons. Okay? <laughs> uh, Baptists do that to chicken, you know? They just divide. Now go, we go on. And you shall keep, your lamb shall be without limits. That means it doesn't have any problems. It's not got a broken leg. It's got, I've uh, got three ears or, uh, one eye, or one leg, or two legs. It's got all its legs. It's without blemish. Okay? And he says, a male, it's got to be a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats. And take it away from its natural city. Not among the goats, not among the uh, uh, sheep. Take them out, separate them. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So you got it on the 10th day of the month. Keep it up for four days. Now according to tradition, they kept this lamb, which was just a small lamb, in the house with them. So in four days, they got acquainted with this lamb. And have you noticed uh, how little lambs are so playful, they are soft, and people like little lambs down. I don't particularly care for them old rams. They're pretty rough. Amen. <laughs> Have you ever been around sheep? Many, any of you been around sheep? Most sheep are, sheep are unusual lambs. They're the dumbest animal on the face of the earth. 
That's why Jesus says we're like sheep. You get that? <laughs> dumb, sheep, dumb. Oh well, we'll go that. Okay, on the 14th day of the week, of a, a month, uh, the same month, that the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall, what? Kill it. Okay, and the same on that 14th day, everybody in Israel was, and, and by the way, uh, they estimate that there were three, five, 3 million people in Israel. So let's just say we could safely say a million and a half <coughs> lambs was going to die on this given night. Yeah. A million and a half, safely say that, possibly three million. We don't know. Three, I say, they're, they're to be killed uh, in the evening, in the evening time, around six o'clock. Because the Jewish day runs and runs different. We run from 12 to midnight to 12 midnight. They divided their day and evening in 12 hour shift. Okay? Now, and they shall take the blood. They shall take the blood. They shall catch the blood. And they were to take that blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. Now what were they supposed to do? They'd take that blood and they had a, a weed called hyssop weed. And they'd take that hyssop weed, dip it down the blood, put some on this side, on that side, and up here. Okay, on the outside of the house. On the outside of the door. Now they did not put any on the uh, on the uh, door in the door, on the sides and on the top. Okay. Notice what it said. Wherein they shall eat it. Now they were not only to kill this lamb, catch the blood, fly to each side over the window, and they were to eat the lamb. Behind those doors. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire. There were a barbecue. Anybody ever eat barbecued lamb? Goat? They said it's good. I said, she I don't know goat. <laughs> you don't know what you might have to eat before it's over. And unleavened bread. Now that means bread that had no uh, yeast in it. No yeast in the bread. It was just flat bread. Okay? And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. The Jews still do this today. Orthodox Jews still do this today. Now they don't kill the lamb, but they eat lamb on the Passover. When they have the Jewish Passover, they still follow this process. Now look what he said. Eat not of it raw. Don't eat it raw. Nor sodden at all with water. Don't eat it boiled or, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. But roast it with fire. In other words, it's got to be barbecued or roasted. His, what's the next word? Uh, head. <clears throat> his head with his legs. And with the prudence there, everything about this lamb was to be eaten. Not the innards. Hallelujah. <laughs> and he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. <laughs> Okay, I got that. <laughs> and thus shall ye eat it. Now this is the way they would eat it, with your loins girded. Now they didn't wear clothes like we did then. What they get did, they gathered their robe around them and had a belt. And they tied up that robe because you know what? They're getting ready to walk. They're getting ready to leave. 
with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. Why are we doing this, Lord? Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this very night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Firstborn of every man or family and beast that were alive at this time. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment I am the Lord. That's what he said. I'm coming through the land of Egypt tonight and I'm going to kill every firstborn of every household and every firstborn of every animal that's alive in Egypt. Now man, that's something else, isn't it? Now he wasn't talking about he wasn't talking about just the Egyptians, he was talking about the Israelites as well. Now here's the condition. Listen to what he says in verse number 13. And why are we putting this blood on this doorway over here? And this and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. In other words, I'm coming through there tonight. I'm on a killing spree. We don't like to hear about God being on a killing spree. We don't like God, a God that kills and hurts and, and causes problems for people. We like that God that loves us and is kind to us and, and just thrilled to death that we are in His family. Well, that's one side of God, but I'm talking about the other side of God now. Okay? And he said this. He said, every house that has the firstborn in it and animals that are firstborn, I'm coming through there and the blood's going to be a token for you. And listen to what he says then. And when I see the what? Blood. Blood. Say that again. Blood. Blood. He sees looking for what? Blood. He's not looking to see what color you are. Oh, he's not looking to see how great you are. He's not looking to see how much money you got. He's not looking to see how intelligent you are. Yeah, he's not looking to see how important position you got. He's not looking for none of that. He's looking to see what? Blood. The blood. He's only interested in one thing, and that the blood. I'm looking for the blood. And he said this, I will pass over you. The house that had the blood up here, down there, on this side, he said, I will pass over that house. No one dies there. Nothing dies there. No death's going to go there. But notice this, he said, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be of you, upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now I don't have time to read the rest of this story. The Bible says that when he came through that night that he smote the firstborn even in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh's oldest boy died. Dead. Dead as a hammer, graveyard dead. And they couldn't explain why he died. Problem was a specimen of hell. I'll tell you why he died. Because they didn't have the blood on the palace doors. That's why he died. Now I'm going to speak to you this morning. <coughs> yes. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to preach on this morning? <laughs> the blood. When I see the blood. Have you, have you ever seen blood? 
How many of you have seen your blood? That's even more scary, isn't it? Just to see blood, but when I see mine, it makes a big difference when I see mine. <laughs> have you ever been driving down the road and seen blood on the road? Mm -hmm. And you wonder if it was an animal or it was a human? What was it? But blood always gets your attention. Isn't it remarkable? We look for blood. We, look, we see the blood that's spilled. And we think of all the blood that's been spilled. On that one night alone, one night alone, one million and a half plus probably little lambs. Now, how much blood, how many gallons, how many million gallons of blood do you think maybe was shed that night that ran out of that though the throats of those little old lambs as they were slain. How many million gallons of blood do you think that was shed that night? No telling how much blood was shed. But I'm going to tell you this. Blood is an important thing. Did you know this? The life of the flesh is in the blood. Doc, that's what the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says. The life of the flesh is in the blood. What will happen to you if you bring all the blood out of your body? You'll die. Did you know this? The doctors were so smart at one time they didn't believe that. They actually bled our first president to death. Yep. They believed that if you just bleed a person, that the disease or the sickness that they had would be gone. It would run out with the blood. And so they kept bleeding George Washington and bleeding him and bleeding him until finally he was so weak that he couldn't live. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Now the Bible tells us the opposite of this story, not the opposite of the completion of this story, and that story winds up all the way over in the New Testament, and it has to do with an individual who was born as a little baby. His name was Jesus. He was born into this world. Now Jesus didn't have a nursery father. Jesus was not Joseph's boy. He was Mary's son, but he was not Joseph's son. Because Jesus was the son of God. And the Bible tells us that he lived 33 and a half years, and he only served at the end of that 33 and a half years. They took him and nailed him to a cross, and he died on the cross. And the Bible says that when he died, there was a man who came by one of the soldiers with a spear and pushed that spear into his side. And the Bible says, water and blood went forth. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ shed his blood for a purpose. And the Bible tells us that that purpose is to save you and me. Now here's the deal. Here's the deal. You live in your flesh house. And the Bible tells us that unless you have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your flesh house, which is your body. By the way, I don't really see you. I just see the house where you live. You come down my street if I'm at home. You just see the house where I live. You don't see me. I'm in the house. And see, I'm in the house this morning. <laughs> you say, Preacher, wow, what a lot of all that. That means nobody knows you but God. Amen. And the Bible tells us if you don't have the blood of Christ applied to you by faith, then my friend, you are going to suffer the judgment of Almighty God. Because one of these days he's going to pass through the land 
And if he does not see the blood, he'd say, well, three times the church thing, but don't worry about that. <laughs> That's what he's looking for. He wasn't looking for that on, in the Egypt. He's not looking to see, he ain't going to check the church roll to see if you are uh, uh, not. He don't care about what that. He's not looking for that right now. He's looking for whether you have the blood applied to your heart and life. You know, a preacher, I'm a good person. That's all the good, but he's not looking to see whether you're a good person or not. You say, well, preacher, you don't know me. You, you really, I don't, but he does. And he knows whether you've got that blood applied to your life or not. He knows whether you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior or not. Amen. He knows that. Yep. And by the way, you know it as well, too. Yep. You say, well, I'm confused. I don't know. <laughs> I want you to see some things about this blood. This blood is not like your blood. Did you? And I want you to. I want you to understand this: that your blood and my blood and every other human being's blood, except Jesus Christ, is tainted by sin. You see, sin is passed on from Adam. From in the, Adam was a sinner, so everything Adam produced was a sinner. And we're children of Adam, and we have corrupt blood. We have sinful blood. And because we have a sinful blood, have sinful blood, we have a sinful nature. That's why I said, why you have you ever noticed if you don't have to teach a kid to lie? <laughs> have you ever set the kid down and said, okay now, son, today we're going to we're going to cover lies. Okay, this is how you do it. When somebody asks you something, then you just if it, you if you're supposed to say yes, you say no. And if you're supposed to say no, you say yes. You don't have to teach your kid to lie. They lie all the time. They come forth from the room. Whoa, lying. David said, you I know that. I've had kids at 2 o'clock in the morning. They'll wake up. Ah! They're lying. You go check them out. The diaper's dry. You just give them a bottle. They ain't hungry. They ain't wet. They just want to wake you up. <laughs> they lie. See, crying is supposed to represent I'm hungry or I'm wet. And they lie to you. <laughs> but you see, the deal is, we don't have to be taught that. So we're born into the world sinners. Now, we've got to be transferred from that place to the place that we're not sinners. And the Bible teaches us that it can't be done by blood. It doesn't make the difference who you are. It doesn't make the difference how famous your parents might be, how wealthy your parents may be, how intellectual your parents may be. It doesn't make the difference how much you have and don't have. You are lost in your natural state. You're lost. And if God, and by the way, God don't wait till you get old to visit you. Did you know this? Somewhere in this land, overnight, a 12-year-old boy died. A 12-year-old girl died. A 11-year-old boy died. A 11-year-old girl. A 5-year-old boy died. A 5-year-old girl died. A 20-year-old boy died. A 20-year-old girl died. Somewhere, it, you don't have to be old. You don't even have to be sick to die. Your time comes, buddy, you're going. You can't control. And not any blood is going to do it. You know, the Bible says this blood had to be from a perfect sheep, from one without any blemish. The blood that makes the atonement for your sins and mine has to be from a perfect man. And the only perfect man that ever lived was Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He is the one and only perfect man. And he came into this world because he was God and because he loved you. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. He didn't save you by being born of a, a little baby in Bethlehem. He didn't save you by living without any sin 
up until he was 33 and a half years old. He didn't save you by giving you great, wonderful things to live by. No, 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 no. All of that was good. But he saved you when he died and shed his blood for you and me on Calvary's cross. So, it's not just any kind of blood that can save you. It has to be applied blood. That being said, you have to apply that blood to your life. You have to trust what that blood can do. Alright? God made a simple proposition with the people that day. He said, you take this blood, you put it up here, down here, down here, and then you go over here and you get in here. And when I come through the land, and I care I, what I'm looking for is what? The blood. the blood. And when I see the blood, I'm going to move on. But if I don't see that blood, everything in there is going to die. That's what he said. And you see, the thing about it is when God looks at your heart and your life, he sees whether you're trusting in the blood. And if you don't have the blood by faith applied to your heart and mind, how do I do that, preacher? You simply say to God, God, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, that he shed his blood on the cross, and I, by faith, I will apply that to my heart and life. I want you to save me. Save me from dying and going to hell. Amen. Have you done that? If you have, you know what? He passes right on up. Yep. But if you ain't, one day he's going to stop at your house. Mm -hmm. He's going to stop where you are. This blood has to be applied. He won't apply it. He will not apply it. He's provided it. He's given His own blood for you. He shed His own blood for you. He poured it out on Calvary so that you might have life. But He's not going to apply it to you. You've got to apply it. You've got to do that. It's your choice. No one knows that He will not he will not make you do that. Now, if you've done that, you are tickled pink in your heart right now. And you are so glad that I'm preaching on this. Amen? Mm -hmm. But if you ain't, you've got questions about it, you might be a little upset with me preaching. What are you preaching that for us for? That's like a preacher preached 700 times on John 7, uh, John 3, 7. You marvel not. You must be born again. Somebody asked him, why do you preach about salvation? He said, marvel not. You must be born again. you got to be born again. Now I'll tell you another thing. This blood is atonement blood. When Jesus died on the cross, you see these pictures where Jesus got a little bit of blood here, a little bit of blood here, a little bit of blood up here, a little bit down here. Jesus, according to the book of Matthew, was a, and the book of Psalms was a bloody mass. He was beaten beyond recognition. His back was torn to shreds from the whipping of the soldiers. His entire body was covered with blood. The ground below him was soaked with his blood. But that's the very blood and I believe this is what happened. Every drop of that blood that fell on the ground, somewhere under the ground, brother, that there was an angel <laughs> with a golden chalice catching every drop. You catch him every drop. You know why? He was sick and young to, to the Father in heaven. Come on now. And he was presenting it up there. He was cleansing all the heavens. Because you see on the day of the atonement, when they killed that lamb, the high priest would take a, a vessel and catch that blood as it ran out of that sacrifice's throat. 
and he would catch that bush and he would take it in and he'd sprinkle it all around. You say, preach, I don't like that. That's a bloody thing. Oh, that's nasty. Not today. We're too, we're too up to date to talk about it. That's why people are lost in their sins and going to hell. Yes. <coughs> There's only one thing that will atone for sin. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. This blood produces a Savior. Did you know that? Turn to the book of Hebrews right quick with me. And I want to hurry up because I don't want to keep this past through today. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse 22 says this, And almost all things are by the law served with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. The Bible tells us that there's no, sh no, no shedding of blood. There is no remission. If Jesus had not shed his blood, he would be no better than Confucius. He would be no better than Socrates. He would be no better than some man alive today. He would be no better than Mother Teresa. He would be no better than any other human being. But what distinguishes him is that he shed his blood, which was perfect blood, and that blood makes uh, remit sin. It pays for sin. It pays for. That's why now when you're saved and the devil gets up or accuses you, say, well, look what they did. Look how, look how they're sinning. Look what they're doing. Look, listen to what they're saying. You know why God doesn't reach out and just snap you off of the face of this earth? You know why he doesn't do that? Because the blood of Christ has been applied. The only thing that stands between you and God and me and God and those Israelites and God's judgment was for the blood of Christ. It pays for sin. It pays for sin. It produces Satan. It purchases a sinner. You see, God said there's one thing that will purchase a sinner. And that, that is the finished work in the blood of Jesus Christ. We're not redeemed with corruptible things, Peter tells us in his epistle. We're not redeemed with silver and gold. There's not enough gold. There's not enough silver. There's not enough jewels in this world to pay for one sin, the simplest of sin. What that cannot do, the blood of Christ can. It purchases a sinner. It purifies a sinner. Now you say, well, preacher, when I get... So I know people who say they're Christians and they don't live right. Yeah, I do too. I do too. But I'm going to tell you what, what. The way we live has no effect on the, the effectiveness of God's blood. The blood that we shed. The way we live after we get saved cannot contaminate that blood. And I'm gonna, I got something to say about that if we go along here. I got a couple more points and I'll be through with you and you go eat your chicken. Okay? <laughs> it preserves the saints. It not only uh, purifies the saints, purifies the saints, but it preserves the saints. How do I know? I got saved January the 8th, 1954. No, 1958. 1958. January the 8th, 1958. I've been saved every day, every second, every minute, every moment, every month, every week since then. Amen. I ain't never been lost since then. Say amen right there. Amen. 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 When did you get saved? You've been saved every day, every week, every moment since that moment you trusted Jesus Christ. You ain't been lost one minute. Did you know why? 
Because when God does something, He does it forever. He don't have to do it over and over and over and over and over. You look at this. You think God said, well, let me see how I'm going to bring a turkey. On the tree. I don't like that one. I don't look good either. God don't have to do anything twice. Once. Why? Because if God had to do something twice, it would mean that he's not perfect. And we're not looking for somebody on our level. Amen? Amen. If that's who you're trusting in, you're in trouble. If you're trusting in this church, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Or any other church, you're in trouble. If you're trusting in anything, save the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. Now, it preserves us. It preserves us. It keeps us safe. The Bible tells us that the devil is constantly before the throne of God accusing Christians over and over and over. Because we are always goofing up, sinning, and doing bad things. Say amen right there. Amen. You know it's true. And the devil said, look at old Gene Chitwood down there, Lord. i tell you what, you're going to put up with that. And if the Lord's holiness took over, he'd go, whack, throw me into hell. But God's holiness is satisfied, not by me. But there's one that comes up and says, yeah, Lord, he done that. I understand that, Father. But look at here. What, the holiness he don't have, I do. And I'm giving my holiness to him. And God says, I'm satisfied. Now, you say, well, what happens then when you do all this stuff? Huh? You say, no, you'll get, you, if you belong to him, He'll straighten that out with you. He'll take care of that. That's why there are people in this world today who say they're Christians. They go out and get drunk, commit adultery, do all kinds of things, and say they belong to the Lord. You may do that once, but you ain't going to do it all the time and go on to Him. Amen? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> but here's the deal. It preserves the saints. It preserves the saints. In the Rotterdam Hall, there was years and years ago, back in the 16th century, they were governed by the Spaniards. And they were so ruthless on the Hollanders that they just persecute them and kill them and they, they suffer terrible. And so the Hollanders revolted against them and so the Spaniards sent their army down to wipe them out. And so the army came and they just, they landed and they just started killing people, just killing people. Going through Rotterdam and just killing people. They'd go down one street, kill everybody on that street. Women, children, men, and, and any human. They came to one house. They, they were going down the street, and there was one house. There was a group of men and women and children in that house, hiding from the army. And they knew that they were just. It, they could hear the army and the screams and so forth from people being killed just houses away from them. And one man, one young man came up with a plan. And his plan was this. They had a goat in that house. And they killed that goat. And they caught the goat's blood. And they poured it out at the door and swept the blood out under the clothes the door. And when... The people came by, the soldiers came by, they saw that blood out there. And the captain of those soldiers said, no use to go there, someone's already killed them. And they moved on. 
Their life was spared because something else died in their place. And you see, your life and my life is spared because someone else called Jesus Christ has died in our place. And we are preserved. Find fault with me, but not with him. Napoleon Bonaparte, after he lost the battle at Waterloo, <clears throat> he had a map that he carried with him everywhere. And on that map, he had circled Waterloo with a red circle. And he put his finger on that circle and he said, it, if it had not been for that red spot, I would be emperor of the world. I see an analogy there. I think the devil puts his finger on Mount Calvary and he says this, if it had not been for that red spot, I would be the king of the world. But Hallelujah this morning for the red spot of Calvary where Jesus Christ paid for our sin, shed his blood that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Thank God for the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm redeemed by the blood. I'm kept by the blood. Now I have one last point. Well, I got two. <laughs> because of this lamb, there's a promise of salvation. There's a promise of salvation in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. I want to read this verse to you. The Bible says this. Uh, Wherefore he is able also, able also to save to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make an exception for them. What I'm saying to you this morning is this. It makes possible salvation to whosoever will. Anybody. I, you don't have to worry about uh, preaching salvation to people. God can save anybody. Amen? Amen. He can save anybody. That's right. I remember a story that Charles Finney told. Charles Finney was a great preacher back in the early, late 18th century, 19th century and early 20th century. He was preaching a revival meeting in Chicago. A man came and sat in his service, and he said, Sir, I want you to go home with me afterwards. And, the, and several people said, You don't need to be associated with that man because he has a terrible reputation. Dr. Finney went with him in a way. He took him down to a saloon. He said, I operate this saloon. Preacher. He said, I've had mothers come in here with their babies and get out on their knees and beg me to close this saloon because their husbands would come down here and drink away their money and they had nothing to do with them. He said, Preacher, do you think God could save a man like that? He said, He sure could. All oh, he's able to say to the other one. And then he said, that ain't all, preacher. He said, if I don't get all the money here at the bar, he said, I got a gambling room over here. They go in there and we try to get every dollar we can from them. And he said, some men come in and lose everything else. He said, preacher, do you think that God can save a person who would do something like that? He said, what, what he's able to say to them. He said, preacher, across the street, I live there. And I have a wife and a little girl. I haven't spoke to them in two or three years. A kind word. He said, I beat up my wife. I've denied my little girl. I've done all kinds of things that you could think about, preacher. He said, do you think God could save a sinner like that? He said, what boy is able to save to the other one. That man got down on his knees. 
and he invited Jesus Christ to come into his heart for him. And I'm here to declare to you this morning that Jesus Christ can save to the other world. He can save anybody. You ain't too far gone. He can help you. And he's the only one that can help you. Now, one last thing I'd like to present to you. Jesus this morning holds out the blood stained hand. Read the book of Isaiah. Who is this that comes from Bozer with a garment stained with blood? With wounded hands. I tell you who it is. It's my Savior. It's Jesus Christ. And he stands and holds out those blood stained hands. Not blood from an animal. Not blood from someone else, but his own blood. His own blood. And he says to you and me, Will you take my hand and walk with me? Will you serve me? Will you live for me? Would you not be ashamed before your friends of me? Would you witness for me day in and day out? Would you be a testimony for me? The, I, this is my blood I shed for you. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. Power in that blood. And only His shed blood. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Can you bear witness with me this morning that you are under the blood this morning? <coughs> if the Lord were to pass over this building this morning, and decide to take out every believer, would you be the gone or would you be left? One day that will happen. The Bible says so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible says that one day the rapture is going to take place. Everybody who has the blood of life is going to answer that call. And we're going to go up to be with Him. To be with Him in the end. Those who do not know Jesus Christ who have not applied that blood, who have not trusted in Jesus, they would be left to suffer the terrible punishment of pain on this earth and then die and go to the devil's hell. Oh, my, my, my. It's the blood. It's all about the blood. And if you know him, you know what I'm talking about. Would you stand with me and we'll have prayer. Father in heaven, this morning, I want to thank you for the blood that was shed for my sorry soul. I want to thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross that paid for my sins and the blood that redeemed my life. My life wasn't worth anything before I got saved. But Lord, you, you saved me from a devil's hell. You saved me from a terrible life. I praise you for that this morning, Lord. I thank you for the blood. I ask you now, Lord, that you'll help each person in this building to know that they are saved by the grace of God, the blood of God, Christ that was shed for them. How many folks this morning, now be honest tonight, don't lie against the blood of Christ. Because if you lie about it, you'll have the blood of Christ on your hand. How many folks can say, Preacher, by faith, I've applied that shed blood to my heart and life. My life, my sins are under the blood this morning. Lift your hand and your testimony. Good morning. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for taking that. Is there someone here to say, Preacher, I don't know. I don't know what my mind under the blood or not. I, I, always, I hope they are, but I don't know. I'm not for sure. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Would you do that? God bless you. Is there somebody else? I'm not sure. I have questions. I don't know. For certain. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Be honest before God. They all know. I don't know. Would you slip your hand up? Let us pray for them. 
Father, I thank you for everyone that lifted their hand and said, I know my life and my soul is under the blood that's been applied. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for these folks who are saved and know it. Then, Father, I pray that you'll be with them and help them to live for you. I pray, the Lord, for those who lifted their hands so that I'm not sure. Lord, don't, don't let them leave here today without being sure. Because they don't know when the call will come. Help them to make sure today to get their soul under the blood. I wonder how many Christians can picture in your mind Jesus standing at your pew. He's holding out a blood-stained hand. And that blood-stained hand is his hand and his own blood. He wants you to follow him. Are you willing to follow him today? Are you willing to say to him, Lord, whatever you want me to do, if you give your life for me, if you gave your blood for me, I'm willing to serve you as best I can. Anyone like that this morning? Anyone like that? Lift your hand and say, Preacher, I want to give my life to God. I want Him to have every bit of my life. I want to put my hand in His nail scars, in His blood stained there. The Lord was Him every day. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up this morning? God bless you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? I want to live for Him. He died for me. So at least I can do is live for Him. Father, in Jesus' name, have your will and way in the lives of these folks that have lifted their hands. This morning, Lord, help us to be faithful to you. I want to do this one more thing. I wonder, if you don't know for certain that you're saved, I'd like to take the Bible and show you how you can know. Would you come and let me do that? Let me get you get you under the, not me get you under the blood, but get you to Jesus and he'll get you under the blood.